Thank you so much to the worship team and with all the new technology that's going on behind the back, um, with all the things that need to fall in place, we're doing good so far. Nobody's been electrocuted. Um, nobody's been fried with um, high-powered um, signals and so on, so we're doing good. Um, well done to the guys who at the back who are driving everything. Next week we uh, go on to YouTube, which will just complicate things even further. Um, so at some stage, not when they're busy working, go and give them a hug and say to them, you know what, guys, ladies, you're doing a great job. You're doing a great job. So as we're continuing in uh, the book of Acts, uh, we're coming to a section that's a fairly lengthy section, chapters, really, the whole of chapter 10 and um, um, almost all of chapter 11. We're not going to read through the entire section. So, like, phew. Uh, the sacred cow that became a Big Mac. That's, in a sense, what the sermon is. The sacred cow that became a Big Mac. So, what is a sacred cow? Well, it's an idea that we have. It's a, maybe it's a particular custom that we subscribe to, a tradition. Um, it's a particular institution or something that we've instituted. And it is always above criticism. Nobody is allowed to criticize sacred cows. Ever touch someone's sacred cow? It is safer to wrestle a Tyrannosaurus Rex, than to touch somebody else's sacred cow. And now, I must remember that sacred cows are never underfed. They're always overfed. And they're big. And they're strong. And they intimidate people because of the way that they are, how big they are. You know how many burgers you can make from a cow? I googled this, and um, Trevor, having uh, been a butcher, maybe you can confirm this, but the person who, because Google's always right, apparently, um, so I read an article, it wasn't very long, because I don't have a long attention span, but they said that well over 2,000 burgers can be made from a cow. Trevor? Here we go, the article's right, Trevor's agreed. Sacred cows can become burgers. The Bible is filled with, with these moments when God, through his graciousness and creative ways, he makes burgers out of sacred cows. The problem comes that when we try to make the burger back into a cow, you can't do it. Ever tried to make a burger back into a cow? It doesn't work. Well, the first problem that you do have is that you have too little meat. So maybe you can make a little cow. That's about it. <laughs> when you get into Acts chapter 10 and 11, this is an experience of the sacred cow that became a Big Mac. Let's, let me give you a, a broad stroke of chapter 10. Cornelius who is a Roman centurion who is um, commanding the Italian regiment up in Caesarea. It's a very important position because Caesarea was the, um, the um, capital f um, of Syria palestinia meaning for Syria and Palestine. It was their capital, the administrative capital, it was also where they commanded the most amount of their forces, the Roman forces, and was also the major port from which all trade moved through. So to be the centurion, the soldier in charge of, of, of the Roman army in that area was a very big deal. And this is a God-fearing man, and he has a vision, an angel, 
bright, a man in bright clothes appears to him and says to him, Go and find the man by the name of Simon, who's living at the tanner's house. Um, go and find him and get him to come to you to come and speak to you. Now notice this. God initiates this. It's a God-initiated thing. Then the scene changes. Peter is on the roof of the house. He's hungry like a typical man, permanently hungry. And he's wanting something to eat. And while he is on the top of the roof and food is being prepared down at the bottom, he goes into a trance and he sees come down from heaven um, a vision. And you'll hear about that vision a little bit later. But in this sheet, this linen sheet that is there before him, is not just one sacred cow. There's a whole herd of sacred cows. Afterwards, three men who have arrived at the tanner's house, the Holy Spirit says to Peter, Go down to them. They're here to speak to you. God initiating. He goes and speaks to them. Now, already now, the sacred cow is starting to show up because a Jew does not engage with a Gentile. Let alone a Roman soldier. Because the, two pe well, the three people who were sent were two servants and a military attendant. A ranking soldier. You don't talk to these people as a Jew. Anyway, Peter goes with them to Cornelius' house. Another sacred cow starting to come up because Jews don't go to Gentile houses. He goes into the house. Another big problem. There he doesn't just find Cornelius. Cornelius has now got together his friends, his relatives, and everybody in the household. This is a ready-made congregation of Gentiles. Peter sees in front of him a major threat to all the sacred cows that he has ever held sacred. It's a God-initiated meeting. Now one lesson that we learn today from this sermon that I hope that we keep it as a theme moving through Jesus recorded in John's gospel has this to say Jesus gave them this answer very truly I tell you the son can do nothing by himself he can only do what he sees his father doing because whatever the father does the son also does keep that in your mind when we jump across to chapter 11, that's where we pick up um, Peter's account. Peter, um, who has been to Cornelius' house, is now summoned to Jerusalem to give an account as to what's happened. And here is Peter's defense. The apostles and believers, this is from um, chapter 11, the apostles and believers throughout Judea heard that the Gentiles also had received the word of God. It should be a time of celebration. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, these circumcised believers criticized him and said, you went into the house of an uncircumcised man and ate with him. It's like, how dare you? How dare you do that? Starting from the beginning, Peter told them the whole story. I was in the city of Joppa praying, and in a trance I saw a vision. I saw something like a large sheet being let down from heaven by its four corners. And it came down to where I was. I looked into it and saw four-footed animals of the earth, wild beasts, reptiles, and birds. Then I heard in a voice telling me, Get up, Peter, kill and eat. I replied, Surely not, Lord. Why? Because this is a sacred cow. Nothing impure or unclean has ever entered my mouth. The voice spoke from heaven a second time. 
Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. That's when the Lord says, don't you start coming bringing sacred cows in front of me. This happened three times. Uh, those of you who've done Bible study with me will know that when something is done more than once, it's for emphasis. God is doing this three times. Don't bring your sacred cow, the Lord's saying. Three times. Peter, you better listen to this. This happened three times, and then it was pulled up to heaven again. Right then, three men who had been sent from Caesarea stopped at the house where I was staying. The Spirit told me to have no hesitation about going with them. I love that, how that's recorded. No hesitation. In other words, Peter, don't even think about your sacred cows. You're going. Whether you like it or not, you're going. These six brothers, now imagine these six guys are with them going, um, did you really have to name us <laughs> as part of this whole thing? Because we don't know what's going to happen to us. These six brothers also went with me and entered the man's house. I wonder what their conversation was about the sacred cows along the way. He told us how he had seen an angel appear in his house and say, Send to Joppa for, man, for, for Simon, who is called Peter. He will bring you a message through which you and all your household will be saved. As I began to speak, the Holy Spirit came on them as he had come on us at the beginning. Then I remembered what the Lord had said. John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So if God gave the same gift he gave us who believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I to think that I could stand in God's way? When they heard this, they had no further objections and praised God, saying, So then, even to Gentiles, God has granted repentance that leads to life. That's incredible. God initiating and moving this against what would be the traditions and, and the sacred cows of the day in the minds of the Jew. Now, let's see a couple of things on, if we could say, a bit of a sidebar, because there's a lot of things that are going on in this story. Now, Luke, who is the author of Acts, is also the author of the Gospel of Luke, they're seen as one work. And so in his gospel, he writes the following when Jesus sent out the 72. When you enter a house, first say, peace to this house. If someone who promotes peace is there, your peace will rest on them. If not, it will return to you. Stay there eating and drinking whatever they give you, for the worker deserves his wages. Do not move around from house to house. Now, this is Mission Work 101. Look for the man of peace to whom you can give the gospel. In this instance, and I've seen this myself in Mission Work, you don't have to look for the man of peace. The Holy Spirit provides it already. Holy Spirit's way ahead of us, way ahead. And so now for the first time in Acts, we read that which Jesus taught the disciples to do when he sent them out, actually been done amongst Gentiles. But there was something that I think that really, in, in a sense, messed with their heads a little bit. Matthew, in his gospel, and Matthew records, uh, records this because he was writing to Jews. When Jesus sent out the twelve... Uh, recording Matthew 10, it says, uh, These twelve Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Do not go among the Gentiles or into any town of the Samaritans. Rather, go to the lost sheep of, of Israel. So one thing can, can be quite certain is that up until this point, the Jews hadn't gone intentionally to any Gentiles. Whatever work they had been doing was exclusively amongst the Jews. To go to a Gentile would be to have to be asked to sacrifice the sacred cow. To say, 
we are now going to be breaking with tradition, which was non-negotiable. And I'm pretty sure that, that those first Jews who heard in Jerusalem that the gospel had now gone to the Gentiles and were criticizing Peter and these six others, that the level of criticism and the emphasis that they had been coming with would have impressed the Sanhedrin. For them, God's promises was exclusive. That's only for us. And they would have understood what Jesus had said through that lens. Only to the Jews. Only to them. Now the one overriding theme that comes in this whole passage is the account is, is that maturity and discernment are crucial in any congregation maturity and discernment are crucial because with that we can learn to see the the way that God is working how he is shaping things how he is opening up new abilities to Take the gospel out. The problem is that when we keep our sacred cows alive, and it's usually at the expense of the gospel, we need to be able to say, whatever biases I have, whatever traditions I hold on to, whatever the framework of how I see life is supposed to be, I've got to say, Lord, if that's a sacred cow that stands in your way, then help me to make burgers. What a joy it is to be able to celebrate the work of God, to see the new ways He's opening up, new pathways to reach different people, people in different sectors of our community, do different and creative ways, and then to align ourselves with what the Lord's doing. It's wonderful. It's exciting. It's also surprising and also humbling to know that God does not necessarily hold the same amount of excitement that we hold over our traditions and our theological debates and the way we do things. God is very excited about how He does stuff. And for Peter... This was the lesson he was having to learn. And the six that went with him, it was a lesson they were having to learn. Because the issue was not so much about the sacred cows of, of, of protecting them, but the issue was right in front of their noses. The gospel is going to Gentiles. And Peter, you're not stopping it. There are a couple of questions we have to ask about this passage, and that is, why does Luke devote two chapters, such a long section, to one Gentile. It's unusual. To one person. Well, maybe if we trace back a little bit in time. Remember the Abrahamic covenant? The covenant was given to Abraham... He was told that God will bless him and he will be a blessing. So this gospel was originally going to go to Jew and Gentile alike. It was going to them. Nobody was going to hold it back. Nobody was going to get more than the other. They were going to get it. The whole gospel was going to the whole world. Isaiah recording prophecy of the words of the Messiah about who the Messiah is, what he's going to do. Listen to these words. Is it too small a thing for you to be my servant to restore the tribes of Jacob and bring back those of Israel I have kept? I will also make you a light for the Gentiles that my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. 
Now, here's a lesson in this. And when we don't learn this lesson, the church suffers. Not just our congregation. The church suffers when we don't learn this lesson. And this is the lesson. The Lord is doing a work. He is initiating it. He is maintaining it. He will bring it to completion. And He is simply asking you and I, to do exactly what he told, what, what Jesus said when he was in de- debating about his authority. Very truly I tell you, the son can do nothing by himself. He can only do what the father sees, what he sees the father doing. Because whatever the father does, the son also does. The church must be doing what God is doing. That is so much what this whole story is about. And why Luke places so much emphasis on it. Peter could have easily gone off on a tangent and done his own thing. And said, I'm not going. But God confronted his sacred cows and said to him, you're not going to bring this up before me. You are going. And you're going without hesitation. And you're going to grab six people by the scruff of the neck and explain to them on the way. And say that probably you're going to take the hit for it. But you're going. Because the gospel is going. Whether you like it or not. And there are times that we don't like the gospel going to certain people. Because it offends our sacred cows. The gospel is for everyone. Everyone. And we as the church are called to simply emulate what Jesus is doing. As he takes the word out, as he initiates things, fall in line with what he is doing. Allow him to do what he is doing. Now from my own experience, And conversations I've had with myself. I don't know if you have conversations with yourself, do you? Every now and then, well, I suppose every now and then, it's probably on a daily basis, Sue will say to me, are you talking to yourself again? (laughs) Yes, I regularly have meetings with myself. Now, you probably may be saying, yes, Royden, I know everything that you're saying. I know what you're saying. I've known this for a long time. There's a difference between knowing it and doing it. Two different things. Knowing it and doing it. You can know how to build a rocket, but can you build a rocket? Two different things. You can know a lot of stuff, but you might not be able to do it. And this is the lesson that has been taught here. Follow what the Lord's doing. See what He's doing and follow Him. So who addresses these kinds of sensitive matters? such as getting rid of our sacred cows. Well, let's look at just as we start to close and the worship team can start coming up. The two main people in this account, Cornelius. Notice that the Lord chose a man who was God-fearing. He didn't know Jesus, but he was God-fearing still. He was a man of integrity, A man who had obviously acted in the correct way with the authority that had been given to him. And he could be entrusted with that. We need to make sure that we can be people who can be trusted with the things of God. The second is Peter. It was important that God used Peter. Because he was the one who was 
leading. And this part of the sermon, I speak to myself. When you lead, you've got to lead knowing that you've heard from the Lord. And not just because it's the in thing or the latest thing. It's what the Lord's doing. And so God uses these two people. And as a result of that, we meeting here today because we Gentiles and because Peter chose to act with maturity and discernment the gospel is with us now the challenge is to us for us to act with discernment and maturity and you say to our sacred cows whether you have one or an entire herd doesn't matter it's just the amount of burgers you're going to have if you've got one sacred cow you can feed your family if you've got a herd invite us all over we'd love to share burgers with you nothing is impossible when the Lord gets hold of us. Let's worship Him.